So we're going to jump into this question now on section five of, uh, of understanding God's will for your life. Let me just get back to it real quick. Uh, should I have some kind of a lead or something? Okay. So the question of understanding God's will for your life. So there's a couple of things we're going to establish in terms of just kind of foundation principle. There's some things that you're going to have to come to agreement on and understand in this particular section, this is really about faith. When it really comes down to it, this now becomes about faith. It becomes about trusting God because if you don't first have that kind of mindset of approach of trust, you're not going to hear or you're not going to listen or you're going to cancel out what you hear. When you already think you know what you want to do, you're not really listening for something different. And sometimes, you know, we want just God to just knock us over the head and push us in the direction that he wants us to go. And then we'll know it's God. It is not always, it don't always work like that, right? In fact, most times it doesn't. There are times, and you know, when we look at the Bible, I think sometimes we uh, I don't know what the quite the right word is, whether we underestimate, overestimate. Uh, when we see the Bible, we see history over a matter of a couple of chapters. And it may look like, wow, God is constantly talking to this person, doing that. He's talking to Moses again. He tells Moses to do this, tells people to do this, talks to Joshua, talks to Elijah. We see all these things and it feels like God is talking, 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 talking. But oftentimes what we forget is that these are written over years and years and years. You're looking at a synopsis of 40 years or 20 years or even more years. And they're talking about the times when God spoke. When you look at a lot of the prophecies and the prophets, they hear the voice of God. It, it's not necessarily an everyday, every minute thing. There are people today who I really think don't get that. And so they come on like every hour talking about the Lord spoke to me and the Lord said, right? You know, that's you know, that's not always <laughs> the way it works, right? Oh, just God just told me something else. Here we go. You know, there God works in various ways in terms of how he communicates. We'll talk about that in a moment. There are aspects of things like prophetic and prophetic mantles. When the presence of God is upon you and God begins to lead and direct and typically those mantles come and then they lift. I've talked to many prophets. I've seen many great prophets and they're like, oh, spirit lifted. I ain't got nothing else to say. The people who really understand how God operates and moves will know the difference between God is speaking right now and, okay, I'm not hearing God. God is not saying anything right now. And if I say anything more, I'm going to say it in my own, out of my own sense rather than it truly being God. You have to be able to, to, to um, dis make a distinction between God's voice and your voice. That's very important because sometimes we try and, and treat them like they're the same. Like if I said it, that means God said it. Now, I do believe, and I've said this before, if you have a strong enough relationship with God, you can come to a point where God will honor what you speak because what you speak is in alignment with him. God is never going to have you go and do something that's outside of his will, outside of his word, that's contradicting to, contradict, contradictory to what he wants to do. There's a story, I believe, in the book of Numbers, where it talks about uh, one of the kings that wanted, um, Baal, Baal, I think, that wanted Balaam, I always get them mixed up, wanted the prophet to come and curse the people of God. And we see very clearly from that story to the prophet, that sounded like not a bad deal because this guy was going to pay him to curse these people. And he was like, look, we could take this, God, and I can offer you a sacrifice from this. This is good. We're going to get we're gonna get something for this, right? I'm probably saying, finally, right? Been prophesying all this time, right? And, and getting nothing for it. We got an opportunity. All he wants to do is say a couple words, boom, boom, boom. And if he had said them because he was called by God into that position, God would have honored what he said but god would not allow him to say something that contradicted what he wanted to do speaking god god wanted to do so he held him back that's the whole 
thing that you see about him traveling down the road and his donkey stops moving and resists him and then the donkey talks to him you've heard that story it's that that story because god would not allow him to do in his name what he wanted to do which was really for his own sake even though he convinced himself he was doing it for god right so god has a way this alignment in terms of us hearing from god right first of all it's not every word, everything you think is not necessarily God. I'm just going to throw that out there. Everything that you think, because our mind is corrupted anyway, everything you think is not necessarily of God. It has to be tested and tried in a way that you understand that this is really God speaking to you and not yourself. And we'll talk about that a little bit more later and especially next week in terms of understanding the voice of God. But we have to base all of this, and I started this with the understanding that we have to trust God. We have to have faith in what God is doing. We have to believe that he's, number one, qualified to define for us what our purpose in life should be. We have to trust that. We have to believe in that, that whatever God is going to say to me, amen, is going to be in my best interest, even if I don't personally agree with it. Because this is the real challenge of following after God. It's believing and trusting him when what he's saying, doing, thinking is not in agreement with what we want. Mm. It's easy for us to follow God, trust God for direction, for his will, as long as God's sending us where we think we ought to go. Right? I think I need to go this direction. God confirms it. Oh, I'm ready to go. Right? When I think I need to go this direction and something is saying no, that's where the real challenge comes in because we're like, that can't be God, right? No, 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 because my mind is already fixed this way. We go to God oftentimes and pray God do what we want him to do. Lord, here's what I want to do. I'm asking, I'm asking you to bless it. I'm asking you to multiply because this is what I want to do, right? We don't go to God with not my will, Lord, let your will be done. We go with God, this is this is what I think is the right thing. Lord, come on, bless it. Let's let's do this, right? So we have to start this on the basis of believing and trusting in God and understanding that he is well qualified to instruct us in what's right. Better qualified than we are of ourselves. So let's go into our book here and we have some things about this. The first part of this talks and starts right with this. God knows best. We got to believe it. You got to believe that God knows best. So come on, somebody type it out. If you believe it today, I want you to type it out. God knows best. I want you to type it like if you're in the church, you would speak it. And a lot of times we make you speak it because what you speak aligns with your heart. Now in modern day social social media, we type, but you can talk it wherever you are as well. God knows best. You have to believe that, right? And even in tough times, when it's hard to believe it, when there are challenges in life, that's when you have to rise to the occasion and say, okay, God knows best. God knows best. Lord, tell me what to do. Lead me because I believe that you know best. So we've talked about this in the past, that he's omniscient, omnipresent, all-knowing. He's all-powerful. He is more than qualified to instruct us in terms of what we should do. And so when God speaks, and however God speaks, we have to be ready and willing to acknowledge that and to be obedient to that, to follow that. We have to be able to be led, right? Some people, they're just not going to be led, right? I, look, as a pastor, I know you try and help people, instruct them, give them something that's from a spiritual perspective. That's what we do. And, and people, I don't want to do that, right? You tell them, look, you need to forgive that person. Mm, no, no, they, no, they need to repent to me. They need to come to me. Listen, you need to deal with your heart, right? But, and, but we often have our mindset so locked into our rationale of what is right, that we are not in a place to truly follow after the things that God wants to say in our life. So it starts with this element. You got to believe, right? A couple of scriptures here, Romans 11, 33, oh, the depth of the riches of the wisdom and knowledge of God, mm, how unsearchable his judgments and his past beyond tracing out. God is way, way past, past anything that we're able to even comprehend. Right? First Corinthians 1 and 25, for the foolishness of God 
is wiser than man's wisdom. The foolish God in his most foolish state, if it's possible, his most foolish thoughts and imaginations and concepts would be far beyond the wisest thought of any man on earth. The weaknesses of God is stronger than man's strength. He's way past us. Isaiah 55 and 8, for my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways, my ways, declares the Lord. So you cannot judge what God is speaking into your life based on your own simple opinion. In fact, you could ask the question, how dare you even try, right? How dare we even try and compare what I think about the situation with God? Well, God, I hear you, but here's what I think, right? Like we're going to have a one-on-one 50-50 with God <laughs> about how things should work, right? I think you should kill him. That's what I think you should do. I think, Lord, you should just wipe them out, take them out of the situation, take them out of my life, right? And then, then everything would be good. And we may not say kill them, but look, we feel everything would be better if this person just went away. Huh? It would be so much better for me if this person was not in the equation. Lord, why don't you do something about that? Sometimes we need to understand the reason the person is in the equation is because God is trying to help you deal with some things. And we get so fixated on people. We talk about this all the time. We don't, the Bible says we wrestle not against flesh and blood. We don't fight people. We fight spirits. It's hard for us to truly learn and understand that lesson because we see people. Even though we may think spirit, we see people and we want to fight the person rather than fighting the spirit. We need to understand the spiritual atmosphere of what is taking place. And oftentimes, even things that you think might be the devil really aren't the devil. It's God trying to help you prune some stuff out of you. Sometimes you need somebody that rubs you the wrong way. Oh, here it is. Here we go. Here it is. Sometimes you need somebody, need somebody who rubs you the wrong way because they need to be your sandpaper. They need to help you to smooth out some things that are inside of you. And so the issue isn't about them. Man, I'm going way off track today, but I hope this is helping you. It's not about them. It's about you. And it's about God helping you to smooth out some things in you that have to get right. And so you look at them, mad at them, angry, upset, my boss, my so-called friend, my spouse, man, I'm like, why, how'd I get with them? Why am I in this situation? Why are they doing me like this? And what God is really trying to do is to take some stuff out of you. That's why sometimes you have to stay in a situation until your attitude changes. <laughs> so you get to the point where, you know what? It's good. It don't even matter. Right? We move on. We're, 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 we're healed of it. We're fixed of it. It no longer can be that stumbling block to you. Some stumbling blocks don't go away because God is trying to get you, amen, to get to a place where that stumbling block don't matter anymore. And that's why every time you run away from it, you run into the same stumbling block over here that, that you ran away from to get to over here. And here it is again. It's the same thing. It might look different because it's not people. It's spiritual. It looks different, it's taller, it's darker skin, it's got straight hair instead of curly hair, but it's the same stumbling blocks. You run away from that when you come over here and up oh, this one, this one is tall and, and, and you know, it got it's, man, but it's the same stumbling block because you're trying to fix people when reality, reality is God is trying to fix you. Okay, we have gone way off on a talent tangent, but come on, somebody say yes if it helps you. Somebody say yes if, if you got something out of that. Let's keep going. We need to understand that God knows best. We need to be able to surrender to that concept that God knows best. Listen, let me just tell somebody out there, stop kicking. Stop kicking. Stop fighting. Y'all you like a like a horse that once once won't doesn't want to bridle. You're kicking. You're kicking, kicking, kicking. Trying to get the situation. I'm shaking the whole camera. You're kicking, trying to get the situation to change or to beat your way out of something that God is trying to use to calm you down. <laughs> I'm speaking, I know I'm speaking to somebody today. I don't know who it is. I ain't calling out no names. But God is speaking to somebody. God is trying to calm you down. And so the situation that he's put you in and you feel like you're locked in it is because God is trying to get you to sit there so you can get calm. You ever have a child, you know, is all acting wild? I know I'm helping somebody. <laughs> 
<laughs> you ever have a child is acting wild, and so you you put them in timeout. <laughs> you put them in their room, right? You shut the door, can't come out. Tan temper tantrum, screaming, ah, 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 let me out, let me out. And you're not gonna let them out until what? They get quiet. They sit down. They calm down. Now open the door. I do it with my dog. <laughs> I don't know about y'all. I have to do that sometime with him. Till he calms down. And then we open the door and everything is okay. Some God, times God puts us in a timeout until we learn how to accept what. Look, Jonah was in a timeout. He spent three days in the belly of a whale in a timeout because he had a mindset to run and do his own thing. And God said, No, you're not. So let me get you in this situation, put you in timeout. And in three days, you come out and guess what? By the time he got to land, he was more than ready <laughs> to listen to what God. Listen, don't don't make God have to put you in a timeout. Somebody put that on. Somebody type that on. Don't don't make God have to put you on a timeout. Let's keep going. I'm, I'm getting stuck. I got to keep moving. So God knows everything. We got to trust him. The whole basis, the start of this is that his ways are not our ways. He knows better than us. And so as God speaks, I need to be ready and willing to hear and obey what God has to say. He's interested in us. He's interested in your best. He has your best interests in mind. He's not just trying to punish you for punishment's sake. He's not trying to make your life more miserable. He's not trying to just make it hard for you. We have to believe that when God is allowing us to go through things, there's a purpose. We go to the story in the 23rd Psalms of going through the valley of the shadow of death. Why, God, are you putting me through this valley? Things were so good where we were by the still waters. We had all that, uh, all that wonderful grass. We had the water. Everything was great. Why are you putting me through this valley? The reason is because there was something on the other side. On the other side is a table, the table that's prepared. And so if I don't take you out of this situation that you're comfortable with and transverse you through this dark valley of the shadow of death, not death, but the shadow of it, it looks like I'm going to die here. Man, I hope you all getting this tonight. God's throwing out some gems. It looks like I'm about to die here. Not that you are going to die here, but it looks like it. And so it's the image, the, the idea, the concept that is causing you to curl up in a ball and be afraid and be hysterical. When the reality, God says, you're not really in danger at all. Number one, because I'm with you, right? It's in the scripture. But it's, it's because it's only the shadow of death. It's not real death. God's not putting you there. He's taking you through something that to you might look like it's a problem, but it's really leading you uh, to a better place. And so you got to stick with that. I don't know how I keep sidestepping like this, but God is interested in you, cares for you. He wants the best for you. He's going to take you through what's necessary to make you better. So when that stumbling block keeps bouncing up in front of you, what you really need to get from that is an understanding that this is necessary for me. Huh. That's why it keeps coming back. Because it's necessary. Lord, why? Why again? Why am I going around this mulberry bush, this wilderness again? Why is this showing up again? I just left that area to get away from this and here it is again. Why? 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 Because it's necessary for you. If you stop complaining about what you're seeing and you start really rationalizing with God that there's got to be a reason why I'm going through this. It will change your perspective and it'll change your response. Because if I understand this is what just what I got to deal with and get through to go where I'm going, my whole mind shifts. I just wanted it to go away. I wanted God to deal with it. But God is clearly saying, you got to deal with this. So Lord, show me what I got to deal with so I can move on to, yes, somebody typed it, my next level. These, these are important things. We're, we're on the, the right subject. We're not exactly covering it the way I expected to, but we are on the right subject because all of this has to deal with God navigating your life and understanding his will for your life. A lot of the reason we're not understanding is because we're kicking and wrestling and fighting against what God is really trying to do in our lives for us and through us. Now, let's keep going here. It says God has a plan. 
And that plan is with us in mind. He's got a plan for you. He's got a plan for mankind. He's got a plan for us as individuals, right? For mankind, he loved the world so much that he gave his only son. The plan was for us to be saved, for us to be restored. For us as individuals, he has a plan. Jeremiah 29, 11, 12. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Uh, plans to prosper you and not harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. I don't know if that's 29. That don't sound right. Maybe it is. Uh, but it's, it's the right words. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and future. I thought it was earlier in the book of Jeremiah. But anyway, it's in Jeremiah. Then you will call upon me and come and pray to me and I will listen to you. I know the plans I have for you. God's got a plan in mind for you. Think about that just for a moment. God has a plan with your name on it. Put your name down right now and say there's a plan for me. There's a plan for David Stewart. I can tell you this. I never would have imagined the plan that got me where I am today. I never would have imagined being a bishop. I never would have imagined being a pastor. I never imagined being a minister. That was all contrary to any direction I was interested in going. Why do y'all think I was going to school for chemistry? <laughs> Why do you think I'm a chemist today, right? Because that was not my plan. But it's amazing, the journey, and you really only can begin to really fathom it when you look back. Because you can't see what's coming. In my personal life, I don't know what is yet to come. I'm sure more is yet to come, but I don't know what it is, right? But when you look back, you can say, look at the journey that my life has taken on, taken me on. And I've always come back so many times and said, you know what, the thing that I went through back then or the thing that I did or the effort that I put in for this and that, I thought that was the mountaintop. But what I learned was that that was the preparation step for the next things that God had in mind. I can tell you so many stories of things that I have done in the past that became an asset to the next step that God put me in. Things that I'm doing right now as a bishop trying to help and establish things in Kenya could not have been done if it had not been for previous experiences that God allowed me to take on that prepared me to deal with things that I'm dealing with now. Yeah, I don't know all the stuff I'm dealing with now, but the, trust me, God does it. When we started the church, there were things that we needed to do. We needed musicians. We needed sound systems. We need, needed keyboard. We need all these things. We needed music. We needed all these things that went along with it. We needed contracts signed. You know, it was things from my past that I've always carried and still do now. And so when you realize that God does have a plan for you, and if you allow him, he will work out that plan in your life. But you have to be willing to, first of all, trust that he knows what he's doing. And second of all, that he does have a plan in mind for you. And you have to make up your mind that you're willing to follow that plan. Versus, I just want to do what I want to do. I already know what I want to be. Understand me, if you follow the plan of God, it'll be the best thing that ever happens or could happen in your life. There's a key here to understand about God's time. Because God not only has a plan, but that plan has timing to it. Whenever you think about the plan of God, you also have to recognize the timing of God. God will not only tell you what to do, but he will instruct you as to when to do it. There are some things, that's why some people can't hear certain things too soon. I've seen people that have received prophecies and they've run out immediately and changed their life based on a prophecy they heard. But it can be the right plan in the wrong time. Many times when you hear something prophetically, it's not necessarily for that moment. It's somewhere in the horizon. And oftentimes, get this, oftentimes what God tells you is coming in your future. He's telling you that because there's going to need to be preparation to get you ready for that. This is why he's telling you now, not just to get you excited, not just to get you motivated, but for you to understand you are about to go into preparation. Y'all need to lock this one in too. This is a good one. It's important. When you see and God hears, you know, God speaks to you of something that he's going to be doing with you in the future. Oftentimes, the reason, I'm saying it again because it makes sure you get it. The reason he's showing you that now isn't because you're ready to do it now. It's because he's getting you ready 
for a preparation stage for that thing. So many times people hear a prophecy or God speaks to them and they get ready to go and do it and they're ready, I'm called, I'm appointed, and all of a sudden it becomes disaster, right? God, you, you're ready to go to the next step. We're talking about next step a lot in the church. You're ready to go to the next step. And when you get ready, to, you're, now you're ready to do it and opposition comes. Disasters fall in. You take, feel like you take steps back instead of forward. That's the preparation step. Am I helping you? That's the preparation step towards that thing that God is saying he's about to do with you. You got to be prepared first. And so that means he's going to have to deal with some things. They may have to fix some things, change some things. They have to change your attitude, may have to elevate your level, may have to get you to a point where you're ready to surrender and submit more than you were in the past. So when you hear something from God, something for you to keep in mind, what's the preparation for it? Because God is likely going to have to do some things, maybe strip some things out of your life, maybe adjust you, maybe get you more consecrated, maybe uh, take you out of a crowd, maybe give you some training, whatever it's going to take to prepare you for what ultimately is your destiny. Destiny don't just drop on you. You have to be prepared for destiny, just like you have to be prepared for next step. Am I helping somebody? I'll be seeing thumbs and hearts and all kind of stuff going up because I'm telling you something that you really need to understand on this subject of understanding God's will for your life. I'm, I'm all over around these notes tonight, but this is, this is, this is good stuff. Y'all need to share this with somebody. Um, the Israelites miss God's timing. One example, timing and plan. God will not only tell you what to do, he'll tell you when to do it. So he told them, go ahead, cross Jordan the first time. It's your time. Here's your land. Here's your promise. This is your season. Go ahead and step into your promise. They refused to do it. And what happened? The window of opportunity closed. Then they tried to go again. And guess what? They failed. In fact, they were destroyed uh, by their enemies because the, t the window closed. There is a right thing and a right time. That blessing had to pass on. They never got that window again. Not that crew. That window had to pass, had a promise had to be passed on to the next generation because that generation missed their time in God. Lord, help us not to miss our time so that God has to call somebody else in to do what he had already aligned you to do. I've experienced some things. I remember at one time, when I was uh, in, a, in my former church and God was, we were in a service, it was a worship service, God was speaking and God was speaking to me about saying something. I was on the organ at the time, right? But God was speaking something into my heart, which I knew I should say, and I just wasn't comfortable, bold enough to be able to step up and, and come off the organ and say this. So I didn't say anything. Don't you know, like two minutes after I made up my mind, I'm not going to do it. Somebody in the audience stood up and said the same thing that God had said to me. Now I can say, look at God. God is just, he's everywhere. But for me, it was like, you didn't do it. So God gave it to somebody else. You had your opportunity. You missed your time. That time moved on. Man, I was like, I don't want that to ever happen in my life again. Where God opens up a door for me and I'm not ready and I miss the timing of what God and it passes on to somebody else. The Jews, that, that generation had the opportunity to live their life for the next 40 years in a land of promise. Instead, they let it in, they lived it in a wilderness eating manna and quail and, and looking for rocks to get water out of. <laughs> That's what happened, right? Because they missed their time and the blessing that should have been theirs had to wait for a whole nother generation of people to receive it. Don't, don't miss your time. Tell somebody don't, don't miss your time, timing with God. Um, I'm not going to read all this. It's a continuation of this story that we just described. So let me keep going just for time's sake. Faith in God's plan. You got to have faith. Hebrews 11, 1 and 6. Now faith is being sure. This is uh, in the new NIV. In the King James it says faith is the substance. Faith is being sure of what we hope for. It's an certainty. I like the concept of substance from the King James, which is why it's here, because the substance in essence means it's something that can be solidified. It's something that exists. So whether it's whether it's matter, 
right? You know what I'm talking about? Matter, solids, gases, liquids, it becomes something. It's like the transition from energy to matter. Okay, my scientist is coming out. Energy is something that's in and around us, potential kinetic, but it converts into something. They say, you know, Einstein was, was talked about his e equation of mass and energy, that the two convert, transition from one to the other. You never lose it. It's either one or the other. So that's why we get all of these theories uh, that are associated with kinetic energy and potential energy and forces of motion, all that stuff, right? It's because the concept is that energy turns into mass, mass turns into energy. When you push something and it becomes hot, you've turned the force of that matter into something that now is released as an energy, heat. So I just sell that to say this concept of we, when the, the faith is the substance it's the concept of what you're believing for turned into something of reality. Faith is the substance of what we've hoped for, and it's a certainty or certain of what we don't see. I don't see it yet, but it's an absolute. It's going to happen because my faith is anchored in it, and it's becoming something of reality, right? How many of you believe that you can believe something into reality? Because of the power of God aligning with what you're saying, if you're in alignment with God, you can believe something into reality. Without faith, verse 6, it is impossible to please God, right? And so we have to be able to trust God in this journey, in this walk. If you can't trust God, God can't lead you. Pause right there. Got to pause. If you can't trust God, God can't lead you. So the whole concept of walking according to God's direction falls apart if you can't trust God. You got if you'll, it'll never work. He'll never be able to direct you as you should if you will not trust Him. God reveals on an as-needed basis. That's why I was saying even when I was talking about prophecy, whether it be through somebody or God speaking in your life, God is telling you what you need to know. God is not just giving you thrills. We think of prophets many times as just being a thrilling thing, an exciting thing. Oh, I want to go hear what the prophet's going to tell me today. Like we, we treat prophets like they're soothsayers, like fortune tellers. God will speak to you things that you need to know through prophecy. And by the way, they're not always good things. <laughs> Sometimes a real prophet won't, will tell you some things that you need to hear and, and it may not be the happiest thoughts. It may be something you need to correct. It may be something, amen, that you need instruction on. It may be something to help you to see that the way you're thinking is wrong. So God will tell you what you need to hear and when God speaks to you directly, same thing. He may need to readjust your thinking to move it in a different direction. Most, many of the words that I've truly heard from God speaking to me have been words that have shifted my thinking from where I was. It's one of the reasons I knew it was God, right? Because I was set in one direction and suddenly something came and it was in complete direct, different direction than what I was intending, thinking, or rationalizing. God will tell you what you need to know and then you need to be aligned and prepared for what he's going to do with that. So how does God speak? Um, God speaks in whatever way is necessary for you to hear it. We're going to talk more about this next week, about something more specific to this, more in the next chapter. But God speaks in a way for you to hear it. How did you get saved? Because God spoke to you. How did God speak to you? It could have been through a person. It could have been through a dream. It could have been through a vision. It could have been through a situation. It could have been through a car accident. But God will speak to you in whatever ways that you need so that when you hear it, you'll know that was God. I got no question. That was God in my life that caused that thought, caused that situation, caused that purpose to come through in my life. And by the way, the more resistant you are, typically the more harsh the response needs to be, right? If you're ready and willing to hear and truly receive, then don't necessarily have to be quite as harsh, right? So just, just a little, little help you there, right? So let's keep going. How do I learn God's plan for me? There's a few things here, key things, and we're going to wind this up in a few minutes. How do I learn God's plan for me? First of all, God's map is the Bible. The Bible. 2 Timothy 3.16 says, All scripture is God-breathed. God-breathed, I love it. It's useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. I heard somebody sent me something a while back, and I really got a chance to respond to it. But a man was implying that the only thing that's truly scripture was the Old Testament. 
And uh, yeah, I'm not sure I, I can buy that because uh, what we need to understand is that even in the New Testament, particularly the New Testament, you're seeing and hearing from people who are inspired, who were taught by God directly by God. They were given instruction by God. Now, do humans have frailties? Yes. In some cases, Paul even says, look, I'm giving you this instruction because you need an instruction, but I'm not saying this is from God. This is my best interpretation of what I think you should do and apply to that. I can tell you there are times when I have to do the same thing. We have to use the map of the Bible as the principle upon which we make decisions, but there's times when I have to be able to make a decision or help guide even, you know, 200 churches and pastors in Kenya, right? And uh, we're, we're working right now to try and help standardize what we believe in doctrine, right? And so you get into a lot of questions past being baptized in Jesus' name and believing, accepting Jesus Christ as your personal savior. There's a lot of things past there in terms of what does it mean to be a child of God? And what do I, speaking of all these pastors and leaders, what do I teach my people? How do we deal with some of these subjects, right? So there are principles that we bring from the Bible, but everything is not a literal word. Sometimes it is the intent of the word. Jesus taught about divorce, and he spoke to the intent of the Old Testament. And from that, he brought to them a message of how they needed to address the issue. And so uh, the first thing we do need to deal with going back to this really is the Bible. I truly believe that when it says all scripture. I wasn't there when they canonized every scripture, when they put certain ones in, certain out. But I do believe that this, the Bible never contradicts itself. And through the Bible and the things that are in the Bible, we establish a foundation of what we believe and principles that I believe align with what God would have for us to do and to be. So how do I learn God's plan? First of all, read the Bible, study the Bible, understand the word, reflect what you're thinking and considering back to what does the Bible say about that subject. So that Bible will help us understand God, understand his will and his plan, give us answers to life's questions. You got to know the Bible. If you're going to be a disciple, a child of God, you got to read the Bible, right? If you have never read the Bible all the way through from Genesis to Revelations, I want to encourage you to make that challenge in your life to read it all the way through. It's honestly not that that big, not that long, right? It's no longer than a lot of the novels that people read, right? So you can do it. I mean, there's a chapter, most chapters only take you 5, 10, 15 minutes, the longest, to read. Now, I'm not, talk, not talking about, you know, Psalms 119, the longest chapter in the Bible, but you could read a chapter any night. Right? You just got to make the commitment to do it. You might even want to read two or three. And I'll tell you what I learned when I was just starting to read the Bible was when I got into ministry um, was that I would get caught up. I would think, oh, I'm just going to work my way through this chapter. But I would get caught up and it would lead me into more intrigue. To re I want to read more. I want to know where this is going. I want to know what's next. And so it's just like one of those things like praying. The devil doesn't want you to do it. So it may get hard, be hard to start. But if you get started, you'll find that you'll find things there that will be powerful. Let me give you one other thing on this. Get a Bible. I know there, you know, I come up out of churches where the tradition was King James Version. But it can be very difficult for us to get a practical understanding from thousands and these of the Old English Bible. Get a Bible that is a more modern version. There are some that are better than others, I believe, because some of them try and interpret uh, a, a concept in a way that fits their theology. I truly believe that and could show you that there's some that take out certain scriptures, some because they may feel like it's not truly validated in the history, but some because it doesn't align with their theology, right? That's not the way you do it. Get a book, get a Bible of a modern version that, um, gives you a solid but practical understanding in modern language. And there are several. The Message Bible is a good one. I really these days prefer the New Living Translation Bible as a primary. There's another one called the NLV, the New Life Version, which is another good one from what I've seen. Um, there's some Bibles that I don't necessarily recommend, like the NIV, um, that, that we, we've moved past that. And there are some issues there, so you have to know what you're looking for and not looking for. But the New Living Translation is the one I use the most. There's an older version and a newer version. If you're getting anything now or lately, 
you'll be getting the newer ones. There's a slight difference between the two, but the newest NLV, uh, New Living Translation NLT, um, is the one that I really recommend if you're going to get one. And you'll find you'll get a lot better understanding by reading something that reads more like a clear story to you than trying to have to convert and translate what certain words meant in Old English versus what they mean to us today. So reading the Bible, number one. Number two, um, prayer. Develop a prayer life. Get a consistent time. Make sure your prayer life becomes a two-way conversation, not just a one-way. Spend time in prayer. How do you get better at praying? You, you'd spend time there. And it's not a matter of just sounding good and saying the right words and sounding poetic. It's a matter of talking and communicating with God. It's a matter of sincere, God, I really need to hear from you. God, I really want your help with this. I, I'm bringing this to you, Lord, this situation. I'm praying for my brother, my sister, or this thing that's going on. It's a conversation with God. Remember, with God, it's about relationship. So your prayer doesn't have to be the fancy one that you hear on Sunday morning. Before service started, it doesn't have to be, you know, at some level of perfection. It's just talking to God however you talk, right? And God can talk back to you in a way that you can relate with. So learn how to listen in your prayers. Learn how to wait. A lot of times we just talk, 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 talk. Thank you, Jesus, in Jesus' name, amen. We walk away. We haven't heard anything because we haven't even given a, God a chance to speak. I had the same argument with people surrounding worship services. There are times when we worship, but there's a time we have to pause and listen and receive from God. Open up to God and let him speak back to us. We don't have to be talking or singing the whole time because it's not just a matter of singing to God. It's a matter of worshiping and having relationship with God. The next thing that's on here after prayer is godly counsel. Find someone who's been where you're going. I was... Uh, Listening in, in, I did a sermon not too long ago called Impartation. I'm preparing that for the television series coming up. And that concept of impartation is so important because you can only receive certain things by transfer. God will have certain things as an anointing, as a calling, appointment in your life that will really bless you through transfer. Rather than just getting everything directly from God, God transfers things in just like he did between Elijah and Elijah. It was a transfer of the anointing that happened from one to the next. So impartation is powerful, but impartation comes from being connected to someone who has something that they'll be able to pour into your life. It's the common, today it's the common version of it would be called mentoring. But in the spiritual realm, it's even more than that. It's more than just instructing you out of my experience and wisdom. It's imparting to you something that God has given to me to share with you in the spirit. So getting godly counsel, getting connected to someone that you have a spiritual connection with is very important. Right? So those three things before we go to this last thing, right? How do I learn? God's Bible, God, God's, God's map is the Bible. Prayer, godly counsel. Three things that can be very helpful in helping you to understand God's purpose in your life. That's why you go to church. This is why you hear sermons to help inspire, direct you. This is why you're here tonight in a Bible study to help get something that's helping to gear you in the right direction towards God. This whole series is about discipleship, building your relationship, getting in the right alignment with God, what God wants to do in your life. I'm going to close with these last uh, seven things. They come from Dr. Charles Stanley, passed away not too long ago, but um, was a very well-known uh, preacher, minister. And uh, it's something I heard from him years ago, which I thought was solid. And I thought it was worth sharing. And so if you have your booklet, it's in there. If you don't, you may want to write this down or come back after so that you can uh, pause and get these seven things. If you're questioning what God is saying in your life. Here's several, seven things that you can ask yourself as, if you will, a self-test as to whether this is really God I'm hearing from or is this just something else. Number one, is it consistent with the Word of God? Very, very important. Let me make this a little bit larger for you. Eh, you're almost on full screen. I'll leave it as it is. Uh, so number one is, is, is it consistent with the Word of God? 
if you know you're feeling you should do something that conflicts with what God says in his word, God is not inconsistent like that. God is not going to tell you that he despises something and then tell you, but it's okay for you. God is not inconsistent like that. So if his word says he's got a problem with it, you can trust he's got a problem with it. Yeah, but God, you don't understand how I feel, this, and that, blah, blah, blah. Listen, understand the word. If it conflicts with the word, it ain't God. Number two, is this a wise decision just on the basis of wisdom? God told me to leave my job, to jump over, jump off a bridge, go do this, you know, take off around the world, da 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 da. Well, it's consistent with the word. Is it is it a wise decision? Now that's not the final answer, but that's something. If it's if it's a little bit crazy, then you really need to check a little deeper, right? Just to make sure. If 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 you feel like God is telling you to to quit your job and you have kids at home to take care of and a wife and you're like, well, the Lord's going to provide. Here I go. I'm just jumping ship. You better make sure that that really is in line with what God is, wants you to do. So let's keep going. Can I confidently ask God to enable me to do this? And can I be comfortable enough to say, you know, because some things you want to do, but I wouldn't dare ask God if it's okay because I already know <laughs> it's not right. So can you bring what you're planning to do, thinking about doing to God and say, God, will you support me in doing this thing? Because if it's something that's outside of his will, just like we talked about Baal earlier, right? Yeah, God, I want to I want to curse your people. I think that would be OK. Right. And we'll get something and it'll be good. Can you really tell God that you want to curse one of his people and you want and that's going to be all right? Isn't that kind of in contradiction to God? Number four, do I have a witness or confirmation of the Holy Spirit? Is the Spirit speaking in my life and is there a confirmation? There are times when I'll have think about things, feel things. And one of the things I've learned to do is to wait. I, I won't just jump on something I hear right away. I'll wait. That doesn't mean I don't want to wait so long that I allow it to slip away. But sometimes I need to wait till my spirit really affirms it. I get a comfort in it, a confidence that this is the right way to go, the right thing to do. I do that oftentimes with people when I'm thinking about using people for different things. I'll have to wait on it, hear from God, let it align in my spirit from the inside out. In other words, instead of just being from here, it has to align in my spirit. And when it aligns in my spirit, sometimes I'll do things that I'm not even really sure I want to do yet personally but my spirit is saying this is the right thing to do oh but what's going to happen it could be disastrous it could be a problem I'm not 100% sure but if it aligns in my spirit then I'm ready to make a step on that and that's where come where step taking a step of faith comes in because I may not be completely sold in it even in myself but if this is consistent with the word is a wise decision I can confidently talk to God about it. There's a witness in my spirit. I'm moving in the right direction now. Number five, does this fit who I am as a child of God? If it takes me out of my godly character to do it, I believe the Lord wants me to beat them, <laughs> beat them up. <laughs> right? That that's that's not going to be me as a child of God. I believe God is just all right for me to just tell them what they need to hear. I'm gonna tell them something because they need to hear it, and I know what to say. But is it going to allow me to stay in my <laughs> to stay in my character as a child of God, or am I I'm just getting off on what I feel like I want to do? Right? <laughs> Y'all still with me, right? Does this fit who I am as a child of God? Number six, does this fit God's overall plan for my life? And so I have to keep that perspective in mind. I really want to jump ship today. I'm tired of this. I won't do this no more. But how does this fit in with where God is taking me? Maybe I need to be here a little bit longer. Maybe I need to hold on. Maybe I need to go to be steadfast. So I need to understand God's plan for my life to understand if this is taking me in that direction or whether it's taking me in a whole different direction. You know, I always encourage people. I keep wanting to go back to the to the to other other uh, camera, but I just want to I want to encourage you. I always encourage people. God is not going to have you jumping left and right. And back and forth, stop, start, twist around, jump on your head. God has a tendency of evolving you in a direction. 
And as you begin to see that, you'll begin to see, okay, I'm going to do it. I'm going to go back to the, go back to, we come back to that. As God, as we, as you begin to see God's plan in your life, you see a direction. And God is not just going to take you, in most cases, and just pull you out and shift you. Now, there's times you do that. He did it to Philip, right? And a revival going there. Okay, Philip, time to go. But he took him, even though he didn't understand, he was taking him to another level of what he was doing. He really was. God was still taking him on a direction and using him in the things that he was aligning them him to be and to do. We don't always understand that. But you do want to look at this aspect of, is this in alignment with what God has used me for? It might be different, but you know what? Sometimes God prepared you for that. Right? When the children, when when the disciples, when the apostles got thrust out of Jerusalem because of all the attacks that were coming on the people of God, it would have been easy to say, Man, no, wait a minute, God's purpose was for us to be in Jerusalem and establish the kingdom there, and God was gonna Christ is gonna come back. It's gotta be there, but you know, but God was actually moving them in a direction to fulfill what was his word to them. Go ye therefore into all the world, not just Jerusalem, preach the gospel. So God was pushing them out to fulfill his will. They could have been so locked in what was happening good in Jerusalem that they were actually, they thought they were in God's will, but the reality was they were not doing what God was wanted them to do. He wanted, it was good what you did here, but it's time to expand. So aligning what you're feeling to do or hearing from God to God's overall plan is very important and getting God's guidance on that because sometimes the plan may be expanding and may be tightening and may be shifting but it's not typically going to reverse it's not going to God's not going to tell you okay quit uh, everything you're doing for me quit the ministry quit whatever and just stop it's generally going to expand and continue in a direction the last thing here is will this honor God if whatever you're doing doesn't honor doesn't give glory to God it's probably not from God. It may not necessarily be a bad thing to do, but it's not necessarily what God wants you to do because what we're doing with, that we get from God ought to give glory to God. So these seven things, is it consistent with, your, with the word of God? Is it a wise decision? Can I confidently ask God to enable me to do this? Do I have the witness slash confirmation of the Holy Spirit? Does this fit who I am as a child of God? Does this fit my, God's overall plan for my life? Will this honor God? Seven things for you to consider and keep in mind that I believe will help to guide you in understanding God's will for your life. Well, that's it for tonight. This is our theme for tonight, understanding God's will. I pray this has been a blessing. Listen, I'm going to just tell you, I'm going to tell you like it is. I just gave you a lot of stuff. So I encourage you to go back, uh, review it again. If you haven't shared it with somebody, somebody else may need to hear the exact same thing. But there's some things in this that... Sometimes we don't necessarily want to hear, but we need to hear in terms of what God wants from us. And so I encourage you to let this sink in, let it settle into your heart, share it with somebody, let it change and direct uh, your approach to serving God. Next week, we're going to go into God's place in our daily lives. How does he fit in our routine, in our normal life? We'll talk about that next Wednesday. So join us here then. 